Good morning. VIT Bhopal University is celebrating National Science Week during 25th of February to 3rd March 2022 to commemorate the discovery of Raman effect by Sir C. V. Raman. This event is catalyzed and supported by National Council of Science and Technology Communications, NCSTC DST, New Delhi, and Madhya Pradesh Council of Science and Technology, Bhopal. On behalf of VIT Bhopal University, I welcome you all to the fourth lecture of planned lecture series which is to be delivered by Dr. Vasant G. Sathe, Center Director, UGC DAE Consortium for Scientific Research in Dar. Dr. Sathe will be speaking on discovery of Raman effect. Myself, Dr. Sharachand Drapati, and I have with me Dr. Pradeep Kashyap, and we are our host uh, for today's interaction with our esteemed guest. Dr. Sathe has joined us. We are quite privileged and delighted to host you, sir, on this platform of VIT Bhopal University. We will have the lecture first, and then we'll open the session for Q and A. You can post your questions in the chat box, which can be asked after the talk. Now, I request my fellow colleague, Dr. Pradeep Kumar Kashyap, to introduce our today's speaker to the audience. It's over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Dr. Vasan Sate is center director in the Center of UGC Dairy Consortium for Scientific Research. Dr. Sate did his PhD from UGC Dairy Consortium for Scientific Research, Dairy Ahilna Vishwavidyalaya in 1999 on neutron scattering of some docked perovskites. His research interests include Raman scattering, X ray absorption spectroscopy, X ray and neutron diffraction, epitaxial thin films. He has more than 250 publications in Journal of International Repute. To his credit, he has been awarded with Material Research Society of India Medal 2021, Bioscast Fellowship of Department of Science and Technology, DST India, ICTP Fellowship for working at Synchrotron Italy, Best Thesis Presentation Award in DA Symposium on Solid State Physics in the December 1998, Institute of Physics Select Paper selected by IOP editors for their novelty, significance, and potential impact on future research. Dr. Sati has invented a protocol to trace femtometer scale displacement in single crystal and epitaxial films using polarized Raman spectroscopy. We welcome again Dr. Vasan Sati. It's over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. And let me first of all, uh, uh, thank uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor <coughs> Kamachi Mudguli and uh, uh, Sharad uh, Tripathi for giving me this opportunity to share uh, the excitement of uh, discovery of Raman effect with you. So uh, I also got thrilled some 20 years back when I started reading this particular topic because I started working on Raman spectroscopy. And the first thing which uh, that time I thought I should do is I should understand how discoveries, great discoveries are made. And that is the one of the uh, topics we generally give to our PhD students also, to speak on some of the popular discoveries which were done in the world so that they can understand what how research is done. So the same exercise I took when I started doing Raman spectroscopy and re I read ferociously and rather I enjoyed reading this particular part because it was just a discovery of Raman effect. Was so, I was so thrilled by the personality of Raman uh, that uh, it was really wonderful it means uh, I used to read for two hours, three hours. It's like a novel which is going through. So I will also take you to this particular journey to the discovery of Raman effect and the personality of Raman, which uh, you might be knowing, but let us recall it on the uh, auspicious uh, uh, day of uh, science day, which I held yesterday. And this year's theme that is uh, sustainable de development. I think Raman scattering is going to play a very, very innovative part. Already in many of the biological systems and uh, many of the things, even in uh, coronavirus, some people say that it can be discovered through using uh, Raman spectroscopy very easily in a, a very cheap way. So I'm not expert in biological system, but uh, using this surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, so many things are going to happen using Raman spectroscopy. So it is going to uh, help in uh, environmental cleaning and things like that. So let us uh, go back again. Uh, first of all, Namaskar to all of you. And a very, uh, I would like to offer my greeting on this uh, auspicious day of Mahashivratri to all the viewers. Uh, so Namaskar and Namaskar to Shiv. Uh, let Shiv give us uh, all a creative energy through which we can change the world in a positive sense and way. 
So Raman, as a, you all know, was a very brilliant student since his uh, childhood itself. And he cleared many of the exams ahead of his uh, fellow students and was got selected. Let me not go into the, uh, the uh, time frame of his childhood, but uh, 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 I would like to insist here that he got selected in Indian Civil Services, uh, ICS. That time it was called ICS. Now it is popularly called as IAS. And uh, uh, since he got selected into ICS, he was posted into Calcutta as the Britishers at that time, the capital was Calcutta, not New Delhi. So most of the important offices, government offices and everything were in Kolkata and Raman got a chance of uh, getting there. Please mind that time, even now it is very, very difficult to get selected into IS. That time it was much more difficult and 80 or 90% of the fellows who got selected in ICS were from Britain. But Raman could crack that exam in the first uh, go and got selected and was in Kolkata. But interestingly, before that, Raman was offered some uh, uh, something to go to the Britain, but uh, due to medical reasons, he could not go. And he is always thanking that person who has rejected him on medical grounds uh, that uh, he could achieve so much in life. Otherwise, uh, he would have been stuck in Britain at that time itself. So uh, Raman was uh, then going to the ICS as an accountant. And in during his post-graduation studies itself, he was interested mostly in molecular scattering. See, molecular scattering plays a very important part in our real life also. Huh? So I will come to it that how molecular scattering even in real life also helps us in many understanding many of the phenomena and improving many of our things. So Raman was so keen in this uh, scattering and optical scattering and things like that, that during his MSc, uh, he did a small project and out of it, he wrote a small paper in that time, a very prestigious journal, Philosophical Magazine. And then, so Raman's mind was totally involved in physics and physics research. And being in ICS, he was going to the Calcutta in his routine job, 10.30 to 5 at, uh, uh, so he used to go by tram. So this tram used to go, and when he was traveling from the tram, one day he found there is a, board of Indian Association of Cultivation of Science. So as soon as he found this board, Cultivation of Science, he got interested. So next day, he got down near that particular building, uh, whatever may be the tram station there, and knocked the door of that particular building where this board was uh, there, Cultivation of Science. And a young person opened the door, and then Raman inquired, what is this Cultivation of Science? He told them, hey, I am very eagerly interested in science. Then that particular person was in tears. He was nephew of Mahendra Lal Sarkar. Mahendra Lal Sarkar was a very, uh, very innovative person at that. In this, this, this is a story of 1920s or something. Okay, so he said that uh, 1910 or 1912, this particular society has been found, and Mahendra Lal Sarkar's aim was that scientific temperament and scientific attitude should be developed in the community as a whole. So some small experiment should be carried out uh, by many of the college students or any way which can be innovative. For that, he has founded this society by collecting funds from his friends and family. So he said, the nephew said, after almost nearly 10 years or something, a person has knocked this particular door in order to, uh, which, which is going to, which seems to be going to fulfill the dreams of Mahindra Lal Sarkar and uh, who has opened this society for spreading the scientific attitude and scientific vigor in general uh, society. So he welcomed him uh, with open heart and he said, this all hall is yours. So there was a hall and some small optical instruments over there. Raman quickly, at that time, Raman used to get some thousand rupees per month as a salary. Half of his salary or more than half of his salary, he used to spend in buying scientific small equipments. And in within a year or something, he developed a lab. And his schedule was then started to be very hectic. And uh, he used to get up by 5.30 or something by 6 o'clock. And uh, so that uh, by 6 o'clock, he was in this uh, cultivation of science society and used to start doing experiments, totally engrossed into the experiment. This was, he was alone. So he used to set up all the equipments and experiments alone uh, with the help of the nephew of Mahindra Lal Sarkar, who very ably helped him in doing many of the things. So he used to work till 9, 9.30. Then he used to go uh, back to home 
take a bath and eat something in half an hour and he used to go to his uh, I, uh, ICS office and work there till five o'clock, again come back. And when he used to come back by 5.30 or something till 9, 9.30 in the evening, he used to work again in that cultivation of science uh, society. So in this way, his, he has persuaded his research. And that is why this discovery of Raman effect is uh, taken as the hallmark of science day. Because see, somebody who is really interested in science by heart. So Raman was living science day and night. So he was totally engrossed into it. Of course, he was not behind his duties as a ICS officer. He was doing very well there also. And so he was, uh, but he was never in a dilemma whether to uh, take a prestigious position in government of India or whether to pursue science. He was so eager in science that within few three or four years, this cultivation of science laboratory was much better than compared to any college or university uh, laboratories in Kolkata at that particular time. As Raman's interest was in optics and uh, molecular uh, scattering or something like that, he set up that kind of equipments mostly onto it. We all should understand that <clears throat> Raman was even eager in reading others' uh, uh, research experiences also. And soon Raman discovered, came across some paper by uh, Einstein and Somochulovsky. Somochulovsky was a Russian scientist and Einstein is very well known. These two people very independently discovered <clears throat> what is called nowadays is very well known as critical opulence. What is critical opulence? We all know that if something is very, uh, some uh, liquid is very pure, mostly like if you take water, if it is a distilled water, we all know that it is totally transparent, isn't it? So once you take a tap water, it is not that transparent. There are some particles which are hanging into it and hence the transparency is less. And if you uh, take a, a well water, which is very hard, then we all know that it is even less transparent. So if you are a young student, please go back to your home and see a very distilled water in a, trans in a clean uh, glass, you will see that it is totally transparent, almost uh, nearly 99.999% transparency is there. It depends on your glass container also, but the water is almost 100% transparent if it is 100% pure. Once you add to some impurity into it, if it is Narmada water or tap water, you will find that the transparency will go down. There is some small amount of whitening or blurring which you can see observe into it. And in hard water, which is a well water, it is much more, much less transparent. So why this is happening? Einstein and Sumacholovsky uh, then came to this particular formula that what happens during a phase transition, that is when liquid goes to uh, solid and things like that. They knew that this is getting this scattering, that, that, that this liquid, if it is impure, then it, there is a lot of scattering which is happening into the, this particular event. And this scattering is because of the impurity particles which are over there. See, in general, why, what, why a scattering happens? In our day-to-day -day life experience also, if you realize that if you, are, if you have ever visited Mumbai or something, in a Mumbai local platform, you don't have to scatter. You will be going in some direction and you will continue to there, there. Because the density of population there is nearly uniform. While if it is non-uniform, that is few people are coming from the other side also, and some people are going from one side also, then what will happen? the two will uh, scatter with each other, isn't it? You have to change your path. Scattering means what? You have to change your direction or you have to change your path. That is the scattering that you get scattered. So whenever there is a uniform density, that density is not getting fluctuated, the same thing happens in a liquid or a gas. If it is highly pure, then the density is what? The density is totally uniform, isn't it? There is no change in density. And that is the concept of glass, which I am wearing and if I can see if it is totally transparent, then what happens? Why this is totally transparent? Because the material in this particular glass has very uniform density. If it is a material with a very uniform density, then light is not going to scatter and everything will be transparent. Of course, the focusing property will come because of the uh, concaveness or con convexness of the lens, which I am using over here. But otherwise, the transparency will depend on what? It will depend on the density. If there is a uniform density, and similarly, if it is totally water molecules, if there are no 
other uh, impurities which are present into the system, then the uh, liquid is going to be totally transparent. Most of the liquids, so, uh, which are colorless liquids, will be totally transparent if they are highly pure, that is nearly 100% pure. And Einstein and Samacholowski has gone one step ahead. What they showed, they showed that once there is a phase transition which is happening, that is liquid going to solid or vapor going to liquid and things like that, during this phase transition, they saw that the scattering increases enormously. And they explained it why, why this is happening. Because this uh, liquid is undergoing tremendous fluctuation in density. And why this tremendous fluctuation in density is happening? Because it is undergoing phase transition. And we all know that during phase transition, there is a... Are you lecture there is a uh, during phase transition there is a very high amount of change in compressibility which is happening in any liquid or solid which is taking place and because of this compressibility what is happening the density is going to change we all know density change means what density is related with what because we know that refractive index is related with what refractive index is nothing but velocity of a light in vacuum divided by velocity of light in a medium okay so this relation is there so velocity of the light in a medium will depend on what it will depend on the density of that particular medium so once the density fluctuation is there then the refractive index will fluctuate and because refractive index is getting fluctuation so you will get a large amount of scattering which is taking place in general in society also if you see we get what we get large amount of fluctuations during a phase transition like we inquire uh, encountered during 1947 where india got uh, phase transition from a uh, uh, from a britishers rule to independent indian rule and you know uh, how painful it was huh? always it was very painful means there were large amount of fluctuations that is taking place during any any phase transition that is happening over in a material or in a society or anything Okay, so this type of fluctuations in density gives to large change in uh, density and large change in scattering, which results in what? Which results in blurring of the liquid. So liquid or gas, when it is undergoing a phase transition, there, then you will see that the transmission is nearly zero. It, it is white or blurish or something like that. So uh, Einstein and Sumacholowski gave a formula at that particular time that this scattering cross section during this critical opulence that is the around this phase transition is proportional to one over lambda to the power four okay and that is what is remarkable for raman raman immediately caught his uh, uh, attention to this particular formula that the scattering is proportional to what one over lambda to the power four so smaller the wavelength uh, smaller the wavelength higher will be the scattering cross section which is happening that is number of uh, scattering will enormously increase if the wavelength is smaller and smaller because it is lambda to the power four so raman noticed this particular point immediately and during one of the, his conferences while he was going to the britain he was on a ship okay standing on a ship and g venkat raman Raghavan, who has written a very good biography of raman has written that like a doctor always carries a stethoscope whether he is on holiday or anywhere you uh, raman used to carry his spectrograph he was so interested in scattering that he was carrying his spectrograph and on this uh, uh, ship that time uh, uh, these aeroplanes were not that common so he used to travel by ship so during ship he was observing this particular part and even Rayleigh's, Rayleigh has observed this critical opulence and explain why sky is blue. We all know Rayleigh scattering explains why sky is blue. <clears throat> so the sky is blue because again, the same formula that the scattering is proportional to one over lambda to the power four and the basic colors has the blue, which has the highest frequency or the lowest wavelength. And therefore it scatters the light maximum and that gives the color of the sky as blue. And Rayleigh, Sir Rayleigh has then that time explained that sea is blue because it is nothing but merely a reflection of the sky. And Raman, while traveling during that uh, SS Narkunda, which is taking him from India to Britain for attending a conference, <coughs> observed the color of sea using his spectrograph 
during day during night and all times he was not interested in all other extravaganzas and uh, recreational activities that that were planned on the ship he was always fascinated by the uh, uh, color of the sea and used to observe him and very quickly he recognized that like gases were scattering one over lambda to the power four and giving blue color to the sky similarly the liquid that is the water which is there in the sea when it is totally uh, transparent, that is, it is free of uh, other impurities or colors or flora and fauna, should scatter the light with the same uh, formula that is 1 over lambda to the power 4. And Raman, with the, his genius, has written a very good paper and sent it to the Nature, which was uh, uh, which is now also a very pre prestigious journal and a prestigious journal at that particular time also. So, uh, and once he came back, he then started rigorously on the scattering experiments in his uh, uh, laboratory. And during this laboratory, what he found is that um, he has to discover an equipment that is he has to make a spectrograph we all know now that spectrograph means what it contains two or three mainly three parts minimum three parts are required that is the first part is source the second part is a dispersive element and the third part is detector so raman thought because Nam, raman was never uh, never uh, raman had never to give up attitude so he never say, said or he never complained that I don't have money, how can I, I don't have source, how can I do experiment this and that. So he used sun as, an, uh, as a source, okay. So sun is a source and we all know that sun is always moving when in relation to the earth. So sun is always changing its direction. So can you imagine doing even now doing an spectroscopy experiment when your source is moving? That's nearly impossible. But Raman then divide, uh, devised a heliostat. It was uh, a heliostat. Nowadays, heliostat is very commonly used in all these solar panels in order to uh, in order to mount this solar panel so that they are always facing the sun. So it is nothing but uh, tracking the trajectory of the sun. But doing this some nearly hundred years back was a commendable job. But Raman did it alone, and he set up the heliostat such that this it tracks the uh, uh, trajectory of the sun. And so that the sun rays are always parallel, uh, uh, coming into the parallel and using a collimeter, he then uh, guided that particular sunlight onto his uh, dispersive element. Why it is called a dispersive element? Dispersive elements are nothing but grating, prism or something like that. What these uh, dispersive elements do? They disperse different wavelengths in space, okay, or frequencies. Frequencies and wavelengths are inversely proportional to each other. We all know that. So it disperses the wavelength in space and that is why it is called dispersive elements, isn't it? So Raman was also using this particular, <clears throat> in this particular experiment, dispersive elements in order to find out whether there is a change in wavelength which is taking place. Because that time, when it, this is a story of 1920 or something. <clears throat> so during 1912 or something, Einstein then proposed this, uh, many of the theories and uh, quantum mechanics was evolving. Quantum mechanics was not well established. It was evolving and classical mechanics was quite well evolved at that particular time. And people were not ready to believe quantum mechanics. And that is why the importance of Raman scattering comes that it is going to establish the quantum effect in optics, okay? That if there is an inelastic scattering, because it is difficult to explain inelastic scattering using classical mechanics, okay? You can, you can as such derive the formula using classical mechanics, but as far as intensities of that particular part were concerned, so that was not possible to derive using just simple classical mechanics. So Raman thought, if I can find out even a small change in wavelength during this optical scattering or molecular scattering, I am going to find out the quantum uh, counterpart of this thing. And then in 1922 or something around, Compton discovered this Compton scattering in X-rays and Raman was thrilled. I must, we must find this effect in visible uh, region because then that will that is going to establish the quantum phenomena in visible region also. So Raman started doing this type of an experiments and as source I told you, he took sun as a source and dispersive element, of course he had many calcite crystals and many uh, prisms and gratings with him. And then uh, naked eye he used as a detector. We all know our eyes are the fantastic detectors, of course, but to see change in color, because see inelastic light means what? 
in elastic lines means there should be a change in color or change in frequency or wavelength that should happen. So we all know that the color of a light depends on what? It depends on the wavelength or the frequency of that particular <coughs> light. So if uh, Raman used to use his uh, color glasses and uranium filters in order to make, uh, in order to make uh, this uh, white light, which is coming from the sun into a single color light. It can be a green light, blue light, depending on the filters which we, the, he was using. So he used a white violet filter or something like that, shine a light and try to see whether any other colors are present into it. And then uh, 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 it was a very painful experiment because everything has to be totally dark because I was his detector. So uh, unless you darken everything else, you will not be able to see very faint signals of uh, change in color that is going to take place. So Raman's student actually, uh, and Raman identified some small changes into the, uh, or faint uh, change, very faint light of different color than the incident color. And why this is happening? Then he immediately said, and he called it as a weak fluorescence. So he was not ready to call it as inelastic scattering at that time, because it, it is going to be a bold statement. So he thought that I should first establish it with many liquids and uh, other things. And then only I should make this particular statement that it is nothing but a, uh, a weak fluorescence which is taking place. So Ra what Raman did is the following that uh, Raman student Ramnadan. Now let me share my slides and come to this particular excitement, particular part uh, into it. Uh, Okay, so uh, okay, so then uh, they, they conducted this particular change in color they wanted to see, and then Ramanathan actually said that it is uh, it is a fluorescence, and Ramanathan thought that it was due to impurities mostly, and Raman was aware of this uh, Einstein and Smolchowski's uh, experiment, and then Raman ordered him that. You, you test it for polarization. So we all know that if you take a calcite crystal, then you can test it through your polarization, this thing, whether there is a polarization characteristics or not. If you understand fluorescence, what is a fluorescence? If you shine a light, typically you see these traffic signals and all other things. If you shine a light, then there are two events which are taking place. One is that it gets absorbed and then it re-emits and it re-emits with a characteristic color, isn't it? If the signal of that uh, traffic uh, signs or something, generally they are red in color. So you shine with any light, they are going to reflect as a red light only. So there are two things which are happening. Fluorescence, which is immediate, uh, uh, even when the light is shine, you see the uh, red light, which is over there. And the second one is phosphorescence. Where, where the light is getting emitted, even when you stop uh, shining light onto it. So these two phenomena is typically, typically called luminescence. So in fluorescence and luminescence also what happens? Only there is a change in color which is taking place. And this, <coughs> here what is involved in during emission or absorption, there are impurity levels which are involved into it. So Raman thought that because in a fluorescence, what will happen? In a fluorescence, it is an isotropic phenomena, isn't it? It's an isotropic phenomena. That is, if this particular material is getting fluorous, it will fluoresce in all directions. There is no direction dependence on this particular part. While as when you talk about scattering, that is one uh, particular direction of a photon which is coming and getting scattered into this particular direction, then if you observe in this particular direction, you will not be able to see. So it has a polarization characteristics, okay? What is polarization? Nowadays, this UP election is there. So this term that society is getting highly polarized. So you know what is polarization. So there is a direction dependent. So polarization means thought dependent in when we talk about political polarization. It is most of a thought or belief dependent polarization that different people uh, believe uh, differently and they are very firm on their beliefs. So similarly, uh, in light, 
when we are talking about polarization we say that it is directional dependent and fluorescence naturally is the uh, is the uh, is the phenomena where it is not a directional dependency is there so raman immediately uh, uh, did that there is a polarization effect into it and rejected the impurity hypothesis or fluorescence hypothesis which is there and there this is the this is the seed of the raman effect which was planted in 1925 raman was so confident that he that time wrote to gd birla he said that i needed funds now to purchase source and spectrograph and he said that if you can give me he was so confident uh, about his ideas and uh, his clarity of his thought and uh, hypothesis that he wrote that if i have it i think i can get a nobel prize of india and uh, which came true uh, within 5 years of time uh, so these are some of the excitements which uh, raman spet uh, first student krishnan wrote in his diary notes so let me read that particular part as i have already explained you that all pure liquids show fairly intense fluorescence and what is more interesting is that all of them are strongly polarized this is important so if they are not showing polarization then uh, it could have lead to a uh, uh, conclusion that it may be because of fluorescence which is coming over there so on february 9 1928 uh, krishnan uh, wrote that uh, tried ether vapor and it was surprising that the modified radiation they called it at modified radiation because that radiation is getting change in color so they call it modified radiation at that particular time now we all know that it is called as raman effect was conspicuous professor came from the college at about 3 and this is the greatness of raman that even during such an excitement or something he never gave away his lectures his duties so he used to go to the college take lectures and come back by 3 o'clock or something i missed one point that he was offered a lecturership in presidency college kolkata at that particular time and he readily agreed he gave up his ics job raman gave up his ics job and joined the, the college in order so that he can get more time on the research and that is the uh, greatness of this particular person and uh, he lost lot of monetary benefits also power benefits also during that particular time but he never minded it he was happy in doing research so professor came from the college at about 3 and there was enough sunlight to see for himself he ran about the place shouting all the time that it was a first rate discovery that he was feeling miserable during the lecture because he had had to leave the experiment he asked me to call everybody in the place to see the effect and immediately arranged a most dramatic in a most dramatic manner with the mechanics uh, make arrangements for examining the vapor at high temperatures so he was so so ingenious in designing new experiments that he did this experiments at high temperatures also that whether there is a temperature effect into it or not and on february 28 1928 raman examined the scattered track with a direct vision spectroscope so this spectroscope he could get because of gd birla and then he recorded for the first time on direct vision spectroscope using photographic plate and found that the classical and modified scattering that is there is a change in wavelength which is taking place or frequency that is taking place during this particular part and a clear demonstration of change of wavelength in scattering so this is the one and on march 16 28 uh, he demonstrated this experiment in bangalore and uh, in isc bangalore and it was printed in indian journal of physics on march 31 and he was so confident that raman printed 3000 copies of the paper and posted it to leading laboratories in the world so he was he was not only a very great scientist but he was also a good uh, distributor of the knowledge so he immediately distributed all these things to the world and then beside summerfield other well known scientists recommended raman for the nobel prize for 1930 and i think rest is the uh, history uh just uh, this was the thought raman was not very happy with the situation of universities at that particular time in 1970 uh, or something so he said that everybody should be bold about his their ideas they should uh, say whatever they feel like about the famine of ideas in indian universities raman remarked and this uh, uh, this we all academicians should remember that even a man of sensitivity and imagination can become bound and unfree see bound and unfree when he has to falsify his feelings that is some teacher or somebody is saying something so you just agree to it 
unless you understand this is what he means so when he he has to falsify his feelings if he forces himself to say that he likes what he dislikes and that he believes what he does not believe then he will have to pay the price in that his spontaneous and his creative faculties would dry up and that is the most important part which i personally feel that unless you are very honest to yourself and to the society and to your teachers and everybody that your spontaneity and creative faculties which is the most important for doing new ideas out of the box ideas or research uh, will dry up and then you will not be able to contribute uh, remarkably in this particular field and uh, this is the humble spectrograph see by wooden spectrograph so this is uh, from this side the sunlight used to come later on he used the mercury lamp when he got some money from jd birla and on this side earlier there was a very black uh, uh, cloth he used to put so that the person will be inside and who could see very faint signatures which are coming over there because he has to block the uh, the uh, that color light which is coming entering light like if there is a green color light which is coming you have to block this particular part otherwise your eye will be filled with that green light so that arrangement he did he did by doing a dispersive element over there the angle he used to keep in such a way that that particular uh, light which is the light color of the incident light will not will not get scattered at all and only other wavelengths will get scattered so he used he did all this particular arrangement over here and used to see by and, and later on he used to put a photographic plate over there that is a, a photo track uh, these things and these are the first raman spectra which he has recorded and you can see number of lines which are symmetrically situated around the rayleigh lines uh, 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 which where he has used so this is for carbon tetrachloride the vapor which he has used he had many he recorded many several uh, these things before announcing the uh, uh, discovery to the society just uh, because it's a popular level talk so let me i will just skip all this introduction just uh, give you introduction uh, on uh, uh, polarizability and all that things i normally give a two hour talk or something explaining how th this can be done but uh, it can this raman can be nowadays used for phase transitions because simply uh, you can see that as the symmetry is lowered number of raman modes which are going to appear will be very large so if there are any new modes which are coming and why that is happening a very in very easily you can understand like if you take a cubic crystal then see ultimately what vibrational frequencies will depend on force constant and interatomic distances everything is included now this interatomic distances and atom in three direction in a cubic crystals are same it means i will have vibrational modes which are triply degenerate the energy of the vibrational modes in three direction is same that is what is the meaning of triply degenerate and once it lowers the symmetry to let us say tetragonal or orthorhombic or something then what will happen a is not equal to b sorry a equal to b not equal to c so in two directions the modes will be degenerate in one direction the mode frequency will be slightly different because now force constants are slightly different in that particular direction so instead of four triply degenerate vibrational modes now i will have two uh four doubly degenerate mode and one singly degenerate mode that is number of raman modes will increase so new raman modes appearing below a particular temperature or pressure is a signature of phase transitions so of course uh, all these things uh, we have used the uh, 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 personally used this property of raman that it is highly polarized and all that things in order to uh, find out many of the things these are the raman uh, laser lines with us and as i told you that if you have a fluorescence so fluorescence is defined like this that you have electronic states over there dressed over vibrational states these are all vibrational states and believe me uh, vibrational states are what vibrational states of energy of very small energy compared to electronic energy levels isn't it see a room temperature is 25 milli electron volt and we all know that temperature is stored in a material in the what form it is stored in the material in the form of vibrations so more the number of phonons more will be the temperature which is a, so a phonon is always getting created as the temperature is getting higher and higher so number of phonons are very large with temperature so the phonon energy is typically very small 25 milli electron volt at room temperature while as electronic levels are separated by one or two electron volts typical band gap in semiconductors and insulators is of that size so uh, electronic states are there and that is why raman is so sensitive for any 
small amount of deformation distortion or something because now we can very easily get a get uh, one centimeter inverse we can or even less than a centimeter inverse we can detect very easily centimeter inverse why we are taking because it's a raman shift i have uh, uh, raman shift is what raman shift is that is the change in color which is taking place so change in frequency or change in wavelength which is taking place that we can calculate by taking the incident energy of the photon minus the uh, scattered energy of the photon okay so it is going to give me vibrational energy so this is how this uh, uh, this thing is done and that is why it is called raman shift so there is a shift from the incident phonon which is recorded over there and that is very sensitive so we can record it to 0.5 cm inverse even less uh, sometimes we go to even 0.1 or repeatability if we, our of our spectrograph is 0.01 cm inverse so we are so small 1 cm inverse is typically 1 by 8 milli electron volt so any small amount of change because of strain or uh, local fluctuations or something like that then can be very easily recorded using raman so i will typically give examples a uh, few examples interesting examples of doing raman spectroscopy of course it is very highly this is our raman laboratory a very humble equipment per procured 16 17 years back which has given us a uh, fantastic results and one or two results i will take liberty from the organizer to show which is our own inventions or sort of a new protocol in order to find out displacement atomic displacement of femtometer scale so th this is how raman spectra is recorded so th typically raman scattering is a good tool to investigate so how how can you do that you can identify materials using fingerprint techniques structural phase transitions and local lattice deformations because you don't require long range order over here unlike x ray diffraction where you require long range order periodicity otherwise you will not get x ray peaks here even a single molecule you can record a raman spectra and one nobel prize has been given to um, scientists from misr who invented this uh, uh, how bonding and anti bonding is getting uh, taking place in uh, molecules so he recorded spectra on a single molecule how that bonds is getting formed and how they are going to get getting deformed using femto uh, uh, femtosecond laser so in a femtometer time scale he did experiments on uh, using raman scattering and showed how chemical bonds are getting formed and they are getting dissociated during uh, various processes chemical processes which are there so for him that for that he got this nobel particular prize uh, in 19 i think uh, uh, 85 or 86 something like that of course raman is nowadays highly used in nanostructures and uh, uh, a two dimensional systems and things like that the graphene which is the very very exciting material nowadays can be characterized only unless you show raman you they will not believe that it is a graphene kind of a thing and uh, the centrosymmetry testing and things like that can be done even probing free charge carriers in insulators this can be done this is what we did uh, some 8 uh, or 10 years back and uh, but uh, we are much more excited in our recent results so i will just show few results like uh, if it is an nano particle you see for a bulk raman is coming at a very sharp and lorentzian type of a uh, line shape is coming while as if you go to nano particles as the size is reducing it is the it is getting red shifted red shifted means it uh, the frequency is getting lowered or the wavelength is getting higher and getting broadened and asymmetric so that is the fundamental uh, difference which we so for characterization nano particle you can do it and all these spectra are recorded in few minutes believe me this is in few minutes if you want to do tem and all other thing you have to spend at least hours together loading sample and things like that doing raman is extremely simple in few minutes you will get this type of results okay in half an hour all these samples can be done three or four samples can be done so you get a qualitative information of your sample very easily whether nanoparticles are formed or not i will skip all this part uh, uh, it is highly been used to record diamond or diamond like structures so you can see a very sharp line appearing at 1332 if you have a very sharp line over in 1332 you are sure that diamonds are of very high quality if there is a broadening or disorder then you are sure that there is there are some impurities or uh, distortions in your diamond so if you want to if you are, you have any plan to buy diamond please come to me i will characterize it for you of course with some cost okay so i will uh, of course uh, different phases of uh, titanium oxide which is highly used in industry 
particularly in white paints and pigments and for, for photocatalyst applications. But there are different phases which has different applications, like rutile type phase has application in paint and pigments, while as photocatalysis is anatase type phase is preferred in this type of applications. And you can see Raman spectra is distinct, very distinct. So where why doing Raman spectroscopy, you can very easily find out what whether it is a rutile, whether it is an anatase or whether it is a combination of rutile and anatase and how much it is. And this is the example of graphene which we give. So even we can do Raman mapping because Raman, this micro Raman setup which we have and we may, many of the laboratories have has point by point selectivity. So you can take Raman spectra here, go here, go here, here, here and then produce a Raman map. So these are the Raman maps which are over there. So from here you can identify whether it is a uh, monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene, or uh, graphite like a signature, things like that. So we also did this type of experiments for many of the users from Ramakrishnan and other things and showed where uh, his uh, uh, graphene is very good or bad. Uh, I think I must uh, show some popular examples and uh, uh, stop over here as my given time is getting up. So as I said you that it is highly sensitive. So this, this is a, actually a silicon wafer uh, and uh, some laser irradiation was done onto it. So we, after the laser irradiation, we found that there are white and dark patches. So you see immediately because the strain or the uh, nature of the silicon bond is slightly distorted in these two particular phases. So you can see that black is a white. So in a white portion, and this is this is 520. So you can see it is shifted and this shift can be recorded very easily. So there is, if there is any strain or strain gradient pattern and silicon is a very important material. We all know silicon is highly used in all mobiles, computers and everywhere. And even smallest amount of disorder or strain is going to change the nature or the characteristics of the silicon dramatically and going to give us uh, false results in our devices and something. So in order to characterize silicon, whether to use start before making devices, uh, it can be very easily characterized using Raman spectroscopy. And this is an example of a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So there are some golden, uh, golden strips over there. So wherever we touch the golden strips, you can see that the Raman spectra is enormously enhanced, three or four times enhanced compared to uh, uh, normal Raman spectra. And this is how it is nowadays is going to use for most of the um, investigation in biological viral uh, studies and things like that, where you need to enhance the signal. So this technique is highly used. There are many of these spin phonon coupling and all, I think I will skip into it because you will not understand it. But even local lattice deformations at low temperatures, we could find out using this Raman spectra when there is a new peak which is appearing. So you can see that the peak is not present over here, but that is appearing over in this particular part. And this is the example of phase transition. I think I will not, this is our, also a, a very, uh, a very celebrated work of our group, but let me go not go into it. But of course, this is our recent excitement where we use this polarization analysis in a very ingenious way in order to find out uh, very small uh, distortions in uh, uh, which are present into the system. So just one example I will give the, and I will stop over here. Uh, that is how small change in atom. Suppose atom is moving from a centrosymmetric position. Let us say from, a, uh, I think I, I have much more examples over there. So from a, by femtometer scale. So femtometer is how much it is size of a nucleus. And you know, in most of the scattering experiments, we neglect the uh, nucleus because its size is very small compared to atom. But such a small displacement can also be, if you do a very careful experiments and which we showed that it is possible to find out such displacement in, of course, uh, single crystal or potential thing because polarization means direction dependence. So in polycrystalline, there is no direction which is well defined. So we need single crystal or something. And we come up with these three papers. That is, we solved mystery of why CUO becomes ferroelectric below 230K by doing this particular part. And then we did it in BATIO3 also, that is where it is well known that displacement of TI along C and uh, uh, in NDGAO3 also. So these are the three papers which last year we came up 
uh, using this particular technique. And I will just explain how we have done this particular part. So you see what we talked about, we talked about that there is a change in um, uh, refractive index during scattering or something, or as in uh, Raman scattering, we all know that the polarizability has to change. So this is the polarizability, which we have drawn uh, the, the, a cartoon of the polarizability, which is going to change because if there is any change in titanium, that is if this titanium displaces from a center of symmetry position slightly towards C axis, then the polarizability is going to get modulated like this. So what we did is we, we arranged our experimental geometry in such a way that we could sense this polarizability geometry that, that is change in polarizability, which is taking place through Raman tensors. So uh, this is what exactly we did. And uh, uh, so in orthorhombic, actually, you can see in uh, orthorhombic case, the polarizability is going to change in two directions. And in rhomboidal, we know it is going to change along the displacement is along one, one, one direction. So it is like a fluorescence case. So you take any geometry, uh, directional, uh, these things, and you should get the same results. And this is a very remarkable experiment. You can see in rhomboidal case, the, the slope is same in whether, whenever we change the direct, that the geometry of the experiment also, the change is same. While as in tetragonal case, when we are sensing this polarizability, we could see the intensity falling linearly like this as the polarization falls. While as here, it is nearly the same. Anyway, I, I'm sorry that I could not explain it much to you because of time constraints. Let me show uh, examples of Raman scattering in forensic science. So whether a document is forged or not, that can also be found out by taking this Raman maps. See how forging is done or in documents. Generally, you take a signature of a person and then print something over it, isn't it? So nowadays laser printers are available and it is very easy to take a printout. Once you do, once uh, you, you take a signature on a white paper or on a stamp paper, and then you we can very easily print over it, isn't it? So how to do that? Suppose you take a printout after the signature, then what will happen? Then you will come to know that there the toner particles that is which are there will be on the signature, isn't it? So what people do is they take a Raman imaging near the signature part. So I think uh, this printer ink is yellow and ball print, uh, ball pointing is blue and uh, the paper also gives Raman spectra. So this paper gives this type of a Raman spectra while as this, uh, uh, I think, uh, yes. And printer ink is yellow. So this is the Raman spectra and this is this. So you do Raman mapping and you see that my printer ink is mostly below this uh, blue ball pointing. It means this is not a forged document. If you take a printout, even if there is nothing over there, there will be very small uh, uh, toner particles, which will be over this blue ink. And uh, there are some small things which are visible over there, but they are not remarkable. So in this way, you can very easily find out whether the person has taken the printout first and then taken the signature. They are, like in court, we all say Hosho Havas mein humne sign kiya hai. So whether he has done it in Hosho Havas or he was taken a, a blind signature and then uh, got a printout over it. Uh, similarly, this is an example of adulteration of oil uh, because this oil, if you see, uh, olive oil is very, very costly. So people try to mix different oils into it. Uh, and this is a this thing. So you can see that this green signature. So this typically you, if you notice this two per, per, this particular peak, this two peak ratio is nearly, nearly equal. This is slightly less, but in a olive oil, which is blue in color, the ratio is uh, very different. So you can even find it out how much is the blending of sunflower oil in this adulterate oil, which can be, which have taken place. So there are so many, Raman has discovered it 90 years back or nearly now 92 years back or something like that. But uh, uh, now there are fascinating uh, um, applications of this Raman scattering, which has taken place. Uh, with this note, I think I have uh, taken a lot of time of you. I'm, I'm thankful to all of you for your patient listening and giving me this particular opportunity. These are my students uh, who have helped me on all these things. And I thank all the users and everybody. And uh, uh, to end this particular talk, I would like to say that every brilliant experiment, like every great work of art starts with an act of imagination. So for all keen researchers and all the messages, please start 
imagining a nice experiments and try to fulfill it thank you very much thank you uh thank you so much sir for such a detailed explanation of the science and the technology of roman spectroscopy along with its application starting from the forensics to the food processing as well so uh, and for the blending this particular science uh, with the contemporary social situations and the history so it has become a reference content for everyone whoever wants to know about sir cb raman they can come to our youtube channel that is already live stream it will be available as a recorded video there and they can know about sir cb raman and his achievements i hope the audience got enthralled by witnessing sir cb raman's dedication towards the science and his achieve achievements so now i'd like to request my fellow colleague dr uh, pradeep kashyap to start the q and a session uh, thank you sir for this nice presentation and uh, we have some basic questions from the audience and the first question is that what kind of information we can get about a material with the help of raman spectroscopy okay i will just flash the slide again where i have come to that particular part okay so raman i think the slide is visible to everybody so raman scattering is a good tool to investigate identifying materials it is like a fingerprint technique what is fingerprint technique we all know that fingerprints are uh, very unique uh, prints on the, our hands or thumbs or something so you can identify a person using his fingerprints or his uh, eye irises and things like that similarly each material has a very different uh, raman scattering as i told you in oils also the raman spectra of different oils is different so you can identify which type of oil it is which type of a material it is so this is called a fingerprinting kind of a thing so you make a library of different materials and just try to match your raman spectra with uh, with the library and you come to know what type of a material it is huh? so this is uh, this this is one one thing to do and not in common materials we don't use it because x ray diffraction is a better technique for that particular part but in many of the materials we can do that particularly organic materials oils and this and that all that things then of course i showed i told you that it is highly used in structural phase transitions and local lattice deformations why local lattice deformations because see local lattice deformations will not be reflected in x ray diffraction because that requires what it requires a long range order that is you require lattice periodicity into it but in a raman spectroscopy that is not necessary even a single molecule you can take a raman spectra so local any deformation or strain which is getting generated because of many of the reasons whether it is a magnetic uh, transition or uh, uh, pressure induced or electric or ferroelectric transition or many other things that can be found out it is highly used in uh, nanostructures nowadays to characterize nanostructures particularly carbon nanostructures graphenes and things like that uh, it is uh, again uh, used to find out coupling mechanisms like spin phonon coupling that is if magnetically something is getting ordered what is the effect on its lattice or its spin order or something that can be found it out uh, I, i have already given example of finding out strain in thin films composite single crystals and things like that we can even test whether there is a inversion center present into it uh, into a material or not using uh, simultaneous measurement of raman and ir spectroscopy and uh, there are many more examples and usage in uh, characterization of materials um, thank you sir uh, the second question is uh, again is about the use of raman spectroscopy but they are asking the use of raman spectroscopy in geological and astrobiological sector astrobiological i don't uh, i don't know how much is the use of raman spectroscopy but uh, zoological as i have already explained you that uh, in many of the uh, geological or zoological what he is talking uh, geological geological so in geological of course again to characterize material raman is uh, raman can be very easily used as i have already explained you over there so anything under very high pressure because in geological things there are many things which are under high pressure or something so it is going to change the strength state and that can be characterized like diamonds can be characterized so it's again a geological topic so that can be very easily characterized using raman spectroscopy 
and uh, how pure it is how kind of a thing whether there is a disorder present into it or not can be very easily recognized <clears throat> thank you sir uh, one question is uh, uh, the student is curious about <coughs> the difference between raman spectroscopy and the ir ir spectroscopy okay so i will explain you again with a slide okay so if you see this raman spectroscopy so in a raman spectroscopy what happens uh, these are electronic levels which are present so as i already explained you electronic levels are separated by electron volts uh, some maybe one or two three electron volts while as this vibrational levels are very close to this electronic ground state because it is separated by milli electron volts milli electron volts is three orders of magnitude smaller compared to electron volts we all know this that is why we call that these vibrational modes are dressed over electronic levels so even the ground electronic level there will be vibrational levels that is this change the, the fine tuning of the energy is by this vibrational levels you go to first excited electronic state again they are they are dressed with some vibrational levels and so and so forth so in a raman scattering what is happening this quantum mechanically if you try to understand that it is going from ground state to some uh, virtual level and when it comes back it comes back to excited virtual level uh, excited vibrational level while as in anti stokes what happens a molecule which is already in a excited vibrational level is getting going to some virtual level and when it comes back it comes back to ground level so this is a scattering process huh? so there is a change in energy which is taking place during scattering process while as in a ir spectroscopy what happens you shine almost infrared light why infrared because the energy of the infrared is again in milli electron volt visible light we all know is in what electron volt uh, typically 1.96 we use which is 633 red in color so red starts with somewhere around uh, uh, around this 1.9 or something like that ev and once you go to green it goes to 2.5 and then to blue means near close to 3 ev or something like that so ir we take source because this vibrational levels we wanted to find out the absorption so we all know that if we take a white ir source white means what uh, there are large amount broad ir source i will say then there are all frequencies which are present into the system so when this light is shine into it Uh, the frequencies which match this energy difference gets absorbed so that is why this is the absorption process and that particular frequencies will be uh, will be absent from the spectra so it will be absence of uh, some lines which is recorded in ir spectroscopy while as there is a presence of line because of scattering which is recorded during raman spectroscopy thank you okay. thank you thank you so much sir uh, so on behalf of iit bhopal uh, administration and management i thank you again for giving us uh, uh, for sparing some time and joining us on the auspicious occasion of national science day so there is one announcement for the audience so today we'll be having two more lectures uh, one will be given by dr prakash v ward gaunkar he is emeritus scientist at national chemical laboratory and he will be speaking on chemistry for sustainable development at 12:30 pm and by today evening we'll be having another talk by dr helen elizabeth mason she is emeritus reader of department of applied mathematics and theoretical physics university of cambridge and she will be speaking on solar spectroscopy in ultraviolet and x rays so once again i thank you all for joining us today uh, have have a nice day thank you okay thank you thank you sir